famous parts of the gospel uh, would be the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone has heard of the Sermon on the Mount. And in the history of our Christian faith, it's probably one of the most controversial passages. Theologians and scholars have been all over the place, and how do we really understand what it means? Orthodox Jew Pincus Lapide wrote a short commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. He wrote this, In fact, the history of the impact of the Sermon on the Mount can largely be described in terms of an attempt to domesticate everything in it that is shocking, demanding, and uncompromising, and render it harmless. And in his commentary, he quotes no less of a theologian than Karl Barth, who said, it would be sheer folly to interpret the imperatives of the Sermon on the Mount as if we should bestir ourselves to actualize these pictures. And so the Sermon on the Mount has been softened, reduced, recontextualized and sometimes abandoned, all in order for us to be, ironically, more Christian. And so what I hope to do is start a sermon series that will totally clarify everything and you understand the Sermon on the Mount perfectly. Not true. I've never really studied in detail, nor have I preached through the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm really excited to do this. I want to begin this series that I think will last probably most of the year. We'll be taking breaks for stewardship and Advent and Lent. Uh, but it's, I'm really excited about this. I think it's an incredibly important part of the scriptures. And I'm going to be using, kind of as my guideline, Scott McKnight, a New Testament scholar, who's come out with a new commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And that'll be my major kind of guide. But I'll be dipping into other commentaries. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a, a cost of discipleship, Dallas Willard, and the Divine Conspiracy. And so I want to invite you in this journey to really look at the Sermon on the Mount. And rather than just seeing it and think, I have no idea what to do with it, really to see what God might be saying to us and what meaning that might have for, for us. Now one of the things you need to understand when you read the New Testament is there were no chapter divisions when the New Testament was written. Actually there weren't any paragraphs. I mean it pre it's pretty much when you see the read very compressed. They had four different uh, types of punctuation. And so the authors at this time however, did have devices that they could use to show that there was a transition. And one of the devices that they used to show that there was a transition would be summary statements. And it just so happens that in Matthew, we find these summary statements. Now, if you look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, that's the first transition that we have. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And so what Matthew is doing, or the author, again, we don't really know who wrote Matthew. Tradition has it that it was Matthew who was an apostle, a disciple of Jesus. But the evidence is really, I mean, you can go either way on it. I'm just going to be referring to him as the writer as Matthew. And so what he's doing there, right after the beginning, we have the beginning of the first narratives. Now he's summarizing what's going to be following. He's, going to, he's summarizing and, and sharing the ministry about Jesus. And so this is kind of the key, um, one of the key lead-off summary transitions as alerting us to this piece of the Gospel of Matthew. And then we come to Matthew 9.35. In Matthew 9.35, we find this. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom 
and curing every disease and every sickness. So in 423 through 25, he's saying, okay, this is what I'm going to be telling you about. So then in, in the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So he tells us about what, what Jesus teaches in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Then he shows that what Jesus does is healing in Matthew chapter 8 and 9. And then at the end of 9, he's making a, number, a, a summary statement. This is the sketch about Jesus who I have just told you about. And then we find in Matthew 10, verse 1, there's one more summary statement. And that is, then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. And so those key words about teaching and casting out and healing are actually even more vivid in, in the Greek text. They're the only words or the only places that are really used in this way. So what's happened in Matthew 4, 23 through 25, he's saying, okay, folks, I'm going to sketch the life of this person, Jesus, and I'm going to talk to you about his teaching and what he did. And in 9.35, he said, okay, I just, this is the end of the summary. I'm summarizing what he just did. And then in 10.1, he's saying, now we see that Jesus has authorized the disciples who are following him to also live the sketch of the life and the teaching that we have just given you, okay? So, so that's the context that we have the Sermon on the Mount. Now also, if you look at Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 49, that's the other place where much of the material in the Sermon on the Mount occurs. That's, and they call that, and Luke in that place says it was uh, given on a plane. So scholars think probably what Matthew has done is collected Jesus' teachings, some of the very important teachings, and has gathered them together. Um, Jesus, as he preached and taught for three years, said things, no doubt, many times in, de in, in different settings to different groups of people. It's not like every time he spoke, he came out with something new. He had this kind of core teaching that he would teach. So there's the uh, assumption by many scholars that in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's really kind of collected these and put them all together at, at one place. Now, the other thing that's interesting to understand is in the text that we just read, or the Gospel lesson, it says that uh, when Jesus saw the disciples, he went on the, up on the mountain and sat down, and after he sat down, the disciples came to him. Now, in, if you were a good Jew and someone was talking about a mountain, someone went up on a mountain, who do you think might come to mind? Moses, right. Moses ascended the mountain. He sat down on the mountain. He descended from the mountain. He's the one that received and gave the Torah, the law, to the Jewish people. And Frequently, when you read in Exodus or in uh, Deuteronomy, and it's referring to, Mo to Moses, whenever, frequently Moses is going up uh, to the mountain and coming down from that. He goes to the mountain and, and uh, communes with God, and he comes down and he teaches the people. So one of the things that Matthew, I think, very clearly is trying to do here is to let us know that there was a new Moses, that there was a Moses figure now who has appeared, not in the sense that it is to replace Moses, but Matthew's notion is that what is happening is Jesus is fulfilling Moses. There is a new Moses who has come with a new Torah. Again, the Torah in, in Jesus' understanding, not as a replacement, but as a fulfillment of the Torah. A new Moses who is comes with a new Torah and teaching the new people. Again, the fulfilled people. The sense of fulfillment, not replacement. And so Matthew even more so does this because before Jesus, he, he tells us that Jesus sent it on the mountain. If you think back of the birth stories, what things do Moses and Jesus have in common? <laughs> At their birth, there were dreams associated with both of their births. There was the slaughter of children at both of their births. There was a bad tyrant that they had to escape from after birth. 
they had to flee to another country after their birth, and then they returned to their country. So Matthew very much is setting up and letting us know here that this is a just kind of an accident, oh, Jesus went up in the mountain. In, in Matthew's understanding, he's trying to convey very powerfully and very strongly in a way that Jews would understand, that might understand, that there is something very new that's happening here, and he's beginning to make the messianic claims that the uh, claims that the one that the Jews have been waiting for for lo these many years that Matthew is going to make the claim that it is in Jesus who is the Messiah he's the new Moses he's the one who completed what Moses had come to do he's the one who com the completion of the Torah is in Jesus and so it's important to understand that as we begin to look at the Sermon on the Mount Matthew is setting all of this up so that we are then prepared to look and understand and see that something very new is happening. So what are the implications for you and me? Well, I would say one of the implications is that there is, one, this new teacher. And if you look at the sermon, this is teaching. And at the end, in Matthew 7, 28 and 25, Jesus basically says, do this, okay? I'm teaching you, I want you to follow this. And of course that makes the understanding of the Sermon on the Mount so difficult because it is so challenging and some of the things that are said are so shocking. It's a lot easier if we explain things away or we say, well, uh, actually the Sermon on the Mount was the Torah on steroids just to show us how sinful we are, we couldn't possibly do any of this at all, and it's just to be a, a mirror to reflect our own sinfulness. But Jesus fully expected, at the end of the Sermon on, on the Mount, he expects us to follow. He is the teacher, capital T. I am teaching you the way of the kingdom, and the way of the kingdom is contrary to the way the kingdom of the empire is the way the world normally works. But in my kingdom, in my governance, under, my, under the way God wants things truly to be, I'm calling you to live this new way of living. So we are, one of the implications is we have a new teacher. The second is that there's a new posture for us. We are to be students. We are sitting at Jesus' feet. When he's up in the mountain, his disciples come to him. The twelve and the, and the other crowds are there sitting at his feet, and he is teaching them. He's sharing with them his moral vision of what it is like to live in God's kingdom. How to understand good from bad, and what is the goal of life, and how God wants us to live our lives. So that calls us then in, as to be students. That's where a disciple is. Another good word, I think, is apprentice. So that we are sitting at Jesus' feet as students, as disciples, as apprentices to listen to him and not just to listen to him once but to immerse ourselves and that's why it's important in terms of reading the Bible regularly on a daily basis even in small sentences even if it's small verses is to marinate in the teaching of Jesus so that the more that we understand the more we the more we read the more we immerse ourselves in it the more we begin to take on what his teaching says which leads me to the, a third implication, and that is there is a new obedience. Jesus said at the end, I, this is kind of a nice way to live, take it or leave it, take what, you know, take this, take that, forget that, I'm just joking, or, no, it, there, he, he was saying, if you want to live the way God has intended the world to be, the way life is meant to be, this is the way you are called to live as shocking and as challenging and as unsettling as what I am saying is. Listen to this one, Matthew is saying. It's the new Moses. This is Moses, the one who has fulfilled Moses, the one who has fulfilled the Torah, the one who has been promised, the one that we've been waiting for. Listen to him. Be his student. Follow him. Do what he's doing, and just as Matthew 10, 1 said, as Jesus then kind of uh, anointed the, the disciples to go out 
and follow the life that he was teaching and living, you and I too are called into that same kind of obedience. And so, as we will continue on this journey through the Sermon on the Mount, I would like to encourage you, first of all, to read it. It's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. I thought you'd probably appreciate it if I read just the first two verses and the second two verses, the last two verses, as opposed to reading all the sermon, which ideally I would have wanted to do. But to really familiarize yourself. So for this week, if you can, um, read, the whole, read the whole sermon on the top one setting. It's really doable. And if you can, then just read Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to encourage you throughout the series to really marinate in it. Read it, read it in a daily basis. If you're really pressed for time, just read uh, like two or three verses in the morning. Just, just work your way through consecutively until you've read through everything. So that it becomes part of you. And as we look at some of these really challenging things that Jesus said, that we can be challenged, but you'll be marinating it in yourself. So we'll have a context as we wrestle with what it might mean for us in the 21st century to listen to some of these really hard things that Jesus says and, and try to operate in a way that we know the world does not operate in that way. And the last thing I, I want to say is, Scott McKnight writes this, the Sermon on the Mount crystallizes what Jesus gave to his disciples as the new way of life, the kingdom way of life in a world surrounded by the broken, by the power brokers of empire. From the mountain, the posture of Moses, Jesus utters forth a bill for the kingdom people. And as Jesus descended, he gave those word, he gave those who heard the option of following. The same option stands before every reader of the sermon. Amen. At this time, we want to come before God and offer our joys, our cares, and concerns.